Yeah, so I'm Chris Ferris. I'm an IBM Distinguished Engineer and CTO for Open Tech at IBM. I basically have overall technical responsibility for all of the open source and all the open standards work that we do in IBM. Uh, I am in the cloud unit, and I've been focusing mostly on cloud stuff for the past five years. Um, but this last year, I've been focusing on uh, our blockchain uh, solutions and helped uh, uh, the IBM fellow who's leading the effort, Jerry Cuomo, um, essentially take what had been proprietary IBM closed source blockchain technology and bring that into open source uh, at the Linux Foundation with the help of my buddy over there, Mike Dolan, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the guise of the Hyperledger project. So I'm going to talk this morning, and, and, and again, I've been, I've been around the block, as, as was noted, for, for quite a while. I did start in this space in about 1999 <clears throat> and did a bunch of stuff at the W3C and, uh, and Oasis, and, and I've been focusing mostly on open source over the course of the past five years or so. So let's talk a little bit about... Um, sort of the, the problem that we have with traditional databases and distributed computing. Um, today, when we think about distributed databases, we typically think about something that exists within an enterprise. Right? And you may have multiple copies of this thing to prevent some sort of crash uh, or failure of the system so that you have a backup and you can quickly recover. But the problem is, is that we're using those systems in the context of a business network where we're doing business with multiple parties and in doing so, we're executing transactions between those parties, and we're each keeping our own copy of the source of truth. And what this means, then, is that that can actually get out of sync. Right? You can drop data, you know, transactions on the floor on one side of the equation, and you have to reconcile that periodically, and that can be expensive. You have to go back and audit to make sure that the results that you have on your end of the ledger match what your partner has on his end of the ledger, or her end of the ledger, as the case may be. And then you've got the problem of having to deal with regulators and auditors and so forth, and you need to be able to share the information, and that has to balance and so forth. And it, it's a, it, it, it creates an awful lot of complications. And this is compounded and exacerbated by the fact that, in fact, most businesses involved, uh, involve themselves in multiple different types of partnerships, right? whether it's supply chain and whether you're dealing with your customers, and so as a result, we have this proliferation of all these little sources of truth that are not always reconciled with one another. <clears throat> so we think about this technology that I'll talk about, blockchain. The vision here is that we can actually deliver a shared database technology across the landscape of partnerships. So in other words, my business partner and I can each share the same data. Replicated, we each have our own copy of the same data. So we're dealing with one database as opposed to multiple databases. And this really has a transformative effect on the nature of how we actually transact business, how we do business. And I think that the reason that we're here today is to talk about what are those implications? How does that actually change even how we think about how we regulate business, how we regulate any kind of transaction, how we govern it, what, what kind of legal agreements have to change as a result. <clears throat> so what is a blockchain? So a, you can think about a blockchain essentially as a sort of a cryptographically secured or, or, or you know, uh, secured transaction log, right? So you know, database writes out a transaction log. Every, every update that you do to the, tr to the database is recorded in an append-only log. Now, a blockchain takes this to the next level, and it basically secures, it signs each transaction in the log, and it signs it with the entry that went before it. And so it creates this chain of secure transactions. And so you can prove that the log is the same and hasn't been tampered with, because you would have to basically surgically change the nature of one signature which includes the signature before it, the hash before it, um, in, order, in order to change the state. So that's what a blockchain is. Now, we have this notion of a distributed ledger. And this takes that particular concept, and it uses it in the context of a distributed database. Right? So we're maintaining a ledger. Everybody knows what a ledger is, right? I, mean, I don't have to explain that to people. 
But we essentially take that and we use the blockchain, the ability to have a, a, you know, a tamper-proof transaction log, and we can therefore use that to replicate the state across multiple different copies. And everybody can share in that. And we use a process called consensus to prove that everybody has the same version of that state. Right? And we can do this in a way that even if the network on which those messages are shared is somehow or other compromised, um, that we can actually detect the fact that it's been compromised. And we can sustain up to, and again, it depends on the nature of the algorithm that's used to, to, to achieve consensus. But for instance, in the Bitcoin world, I'll talk about that a little bit, they can achieve consensus, they, they can basically sustain an attack or a compromise of the, ne of the Bitcoin network that consumes almost half of the network, right? So you have to actually get to one more than half, right, before you've actually been able to take over the Bitcoin blockchain. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about, about Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, S Satoshi Nakamoto, we don't know if this person is real or unreal, right? I have a t-shirt that says basically I am I am Satoshi. I, I coined that when we were we were starting the Hyperledger project, and uh, David Walsh was going through and trying to claim that he was Satoshi, um, and uh, failed to do so. Was, but you know, there's there's a lot of different uh, theories that Satoshi is not a one human being, but it was maybe multiple people who collaborated together and developed the the, the, the Bitcoin uh, white paper. <clears throat> but um, so this is, he basically had a breakthrough in solving the Byzantine generals problem. And the, the, this, this problem basically says, we have multiple generals and we're all surrounding the city and we're gonna attack the city, right? But we have to coordinate our attack. We can't have just one general rushing in and attacking because he'll be overwhelmed. And so we have to build consensus amongst all these generals, but we could have some we could, we, you know, the generals could be compromised. One of them could be a spy for the enemy, right? And so we, we, we have to pass messages that say, I'm ready to attack, I'm ready to attack, we're all ready to attack, we're all gonna attack, right? How do we do that without actually having somebody come in and say, basically, I'm gonna fool the other generals into thinking, go ahead, go ahead, attack, you know, and I'll send them bad messages. So we have to be able to do this in a context where the message exchanges is insecure and the network over which we exchange these messages could become compromised by one or more of the, of the nodes. And he came up with this approach that, I, as, I, as I mentioned, it, it sort of allows the Bitcoin network to operate with almost a half of the network actively working to thwart the other half and rewrite history. So Bitcoin essentially is a, it's a cryptocurrency. Um, and, and, and so this means that we're basically, uh, oh, I'm sorry, so, so I should say, so it's a cryptocurrency uh, network, if you will, um, application. And the way that we create the cryptocurrency is we do something called proof of work. This is the, the consensus algorithm that, that he came up with. And the way that this works is that basically we're mining Bitcoins and we do this by solving some kind of complex problem, right? In the case of Bitcoin, they're doing, they're, they're trying to, uh, to, to calculate for a hash of a value that is less than some target value. Um, and so you'll have these transactions that are submitted that basically say, I'm gonna exchange one Bitcoin for, you know, I'm gonna trade a Bitcoin with my partner over here. And, and that transaction will go to all the miners and all the miners will then try to take that transaction, match it with a nonce, hash it to come up with a value that is less than some target value. Um, and this, 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 this process is defined to essentially take about 10 minutes on average, and it basically ensures that randomize who's going to actually win the lottery and create a Bitcoin and mine the particular block. And all of this is dynamically adjusted over time, again, to keep to keep this mining of Bitcoins down to about 10 minutes. Um, and then there's a cap on the total number of Bitcoins that are actually gonna be mined and that basically runs out in about 2040. Um, so we mine a Bitcoin about every 10 minutes. So these are increasing, uh, 
in number, which means the value is decreasing over time. Um, but it's an interesting paradigm because basically they've decentralized currency. So there's no central government or central bank that's managing this currency. It's managed as uh, autonomously by the collection of nodes in that network. <clears throat> so I think that the aha moment for many people was, that's pretty cool. So we have decentralized currency. We've sort of disintermediated the whole need for central governments and or banks to manage a currency. What if we were to apply that in other kind of contexts, not just around currency, but other various business uses, right? What if we could take this notion of a distributed ledger that's keeping track of who owns which Bitcoin and apply that to other types of business transactions? Wouldn't that be kind of cool, right? What if I could have a database that I could share with my business partner rather than having to maintain, each of us having to maintain our own copy of the data about the transactions that we're exchanging with one another. And so, so, this, this, so this basically got a number of people starting to think about how could we apply the technology that underpins Bitcoin, which is the blockchain and the distributed ledger, and put that to use in various other contexts. And so people started thinking about this, and they've come up with you know, a variety of different use cases. In fact, there's, I, I can't think of any industry or any sort of uh, domain that hasn't come up with an idea about how they might apply the technology. Now, of course, just because you can doesn't mean you should right, do a thing. Um, and I think that in the context of blockchain and distributed ledgers, that an awful lot of thinking has to go into whether or not just be, you know, again, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Is the solution that we're thinking about applying the blockchain technology to any given domain, does it make sense? Is it actually going to save money, make a process more efficient, right? Um, and is that sufficient enough to undergo the process of completely re-engineering some sort of business process that we have existing today and all the systems that are attendant to it and so forth? Does that involve, you know, should we go off and have all of our, uh, you know, uh, Congress people and so forth go off and rewrite all the legislation and the regulations that pertain to a particular business or domain in order that we can do this. So there's an awful lot that we have to start thinking through. But, you know, just to give you a taste of some of the use cases that people are thinking about with this technology, supply chain transparency. So this could be, you know, the food chain, for instance, right? Where did I get my potatoes, right? Which farm did they come from? Was that farm, you know, compromised by uh, E. coli, right? And um, so, so people are looking at this from the, per and, and especially I think in Europe, they're looking at it also to track things like GMO foods, right? Did this, did this vegetable come from a GMO farm or no, right? Um, Another use case from a supply chain perspective would be manufacturing, right, and the bill of materials that goes into an automobile or an airplane, right? Understanding what parts go where, being able to record that in a tamper-proof mode um, uh, like we have with the blockchain and distributed ledger would potentially allow us to do things like, you know, if I'm detecting that these cars are failing, their airbags are failing, I can actually trace that back to exactly the batch of airbags that was manufactured, all right, in a tamper-proof way, then that means I could actually sort of determine through analytics and cognitive capabilities that maybe I want to recall this smaller number as opposed to the entire fleet of cars that happened to use that manufacturer's airbags, right? Because it could just be that it was a bad batch, right? So, so people are looking at applying the blockchain technology to solve problems such as what are all the pieces that comprise a particular automobile, vehicle, whatever it might be, uh, airline, whatever. Um, and, and then they're also looking at it from the perspective of, well, what if I wanted to record the maintenance history, right? We've had cases where airlines, you know, airline will crash and then there'll be an investigation by, um, you know, the government and they will say, oh, when was this 
airline, you know, when was this aircraft maintained and where was it maintained and who signed off on it? And there's actually been use case, there's actually been a, a, a samples where the, 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 the maintenance history of an, air, of an aircraft was tampered with to sort of hide the fact that it hadn't been maintained. Um, if we could record this securely on a blockchain in a tamper-proof manner, then we would avoid having that kind of a situation. We'd be able to understand that something was actually maintained and so forth. Um, there's an awful lot of fintech type use cases. Obviously, we, we, you know, we start with Bitcoin and sort of cryptocurrency, but you can think about the token that we're exchanging could be anything. It could be a security, right? Um, and so people are looking at applications such as payments, um, letters of credit, trade finance, um, all kinds of use cases, and, and in, frankly, the, the, uh, the banking industry, the f finance industry has been sort of the most interested in this technology for, for a variety of reasons. They also have an awful lot of money, and so they can invest in doing all kinds of experimentation on, uh, on new technologies. Uh, and I think that it's really this, the disruptive potential that, that exists with blockchain and with distributed ledgers that has many of them interested because everybody wants to be the first one to disrupt everybody else, right? And so they're investing an awful lot of money in trying to figure out how do I, how do I beat everybody else? I'll get to that. Well, actually, I'll, I'll cover that in a second uh, because, you know, one of the challenges we have in trying to figure out how we would and what we would use this technology for is somewhat compromised by the fact that nobody's sharing their use cases because everybody thinks I've got something that's going to just completely transform everything and I'm going to be in charge and I'm going to get all the, the benefits from this disruption. Um, but I think the thing to understand is that for this technology to be effective, it needs to be used in the context of a network, a network of business partners, a network of supply chain, you know, a network of whatever it might be. Um, uh, and it could be public, could be private. Um, and so I think that those who are withholding think, you know, and, and sharing about the, th the types of things that they might want to do with this are only hurting themselves because reality is that we have to sort of work together. We have to recognize that this is something that cannot be controlled by any one party um, if it's going to be successful. The internet was successful not because AOL was the only one, right? It was successful because it's, it's not owned or controlled by any one party. Same thing, I think, applies with blockchain. Um, another use case is Internet of Things and identity and being able to sort of, um, you, know, you know, think about, you know, when, when you, you, know, you, you want to do some things very securely. So I just put, you know, an IoT door lock on my front door, right, that I can control from my phone but obviously, I want to be the only one who can actually open that door, right? I don't want to be able to share that with anybody. So we need to be in a position where we can securely transact with our IoT devices um, such that I'm the only one that actually can open my door or I could exchange a key with somebody who could open it, uh, but I can also revoke that. And so people are looking at Internet of Things applications for the blockchain. Um, also, just recording, uh, I, was, I was talking with some people in the healthcare industry, and, and they're thinking about, okay, so I've got maybe a, a medical device that's recording somebody's glucose levels, for instance, and I want to be able to sort of record that securely and then, and then share that up confidentially in terms of just the values so that we can monitor somebody but do that in a way where we're not actually sharing their identity. Um, so there's another use case that people are thinking about from a healthcare perspective. Um, digital rights management, and in fact, Evan was just saying, you know, before we, we, we got here, you know, think about, you know, could we actually use the blockchain to share software, right? And that's actually, you know, that, that, that's actually a, an, in, an interesting idea. But people are definitely looking at this from the perspective of uh, music, you know, DRM, artwork, any, anything that is digital, virtual, real, whatever, really, we can think about leveraging the blockchain to record. But the important thing 
is that the use cases that probably make the most sense initially are going to be those where there's potential for fraud and abuse that we want to prevent, right? And I think those are the kinds of use cases that are potentially the most interesting beyond just the typical sort of trade um, and, and, and fintech type of use cases. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the existing capabilities that we have in the industry today and some of their limitations. So Bitcoin was sort of the first, you know, that, that pioneered this, this notion of a blockchain used in the context of this cryptocurrency. And it can process a grand total of seven transactions a second. Woohoo! <laughs> um, and so if you think about using that in the context of your typical IT business application, you know, we're talking about, no, that's not going to happen, right? You, know, you need to be able to process multiple thousands of transactions a second for most enterprise type use cases. If you think about something like supply chain, you know, how many potatoes are we shipping, right? So, uh, or, or automobiles, how many cars we manufacture, how many parts go into a car? There's like 10,000 parts that go into a car, right? So how am I going to process at the rate and pace that's necessary to sustain most enterprise type use cases? Um, and then there's the slow time to actually closure on a given transaction. So when I say I'm going to exchange a Bitcoin with Keith, I, I will invoke the transaction. He'll get, yeah, this, is, this is happening. And then it'll try and, and spread throughout all the rest of us here. We're, doing, we're, we're all mining to figure out who gets to mine the block that that transaction goes in. So each of us is off running, trying to solve a puzzle that's going to take about 10 minutes. One of us will hit the jackpot, get a Bitcoin, mine the block, and then share that information with everybody else through messaging. And this takes a minimum of 10 minutes now for us to solve the puzzle, communicate to everybody you know, that Eben was the one who won the lottery. And so therefore, we're all going to record that block in our, in our ledgers. And then we're all going to confirm with each other that indeed everybody got that block, and that's the one. So 10 minutes later, he actually gets the Bitcoin. Um, so for a lot of use cases, especially in the, in the finance uh, industry, that's not good enough either, right? They, they, I mean, you know, yes, they're dealing currently with like two or three days, but they actually want to get it down to sub-second, right? Because the time that the money is sort of in limbo, nobody's, nobody's making any money off of that money. Right? Nobody's earning interest on it. So, um, so people are looking for the ability to sort of pull in the time to closure on a transaction considerably. But again, given the concept of proof of work, that you know, is compromised by the fact that it takes a long time to get closure. And in fact, one of the big complaints about Bitcoin today is that it can, it can be upwards of hours before a transaction is actually finalized. Because you know, you're, you're, you're trying to get into a, a given block, and whoops, I didn't make that one. I'm going to go into the next one. You keep getting bumped, and it takes 10 minutes for each one. And people are complaining it's been up to two hours for some people to get closure on a transaction. Uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, which are sort of the two prominent ones, uh, blockchain technologies, they were designed for cryptocurrency. And this is somewhat problematic, because most enterprises are actually not really keen on involving a cryptocurrency in their business process, right? For a variety of reasons. I mean, when you think about the, the you know, the, the community that sort of developed Bitcoin, it was developed by a bunch of anarchists, basically, because they want to sort of, you know, change how the world works, dis disintermediate all the banks and, 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 and the national uh, currencies and so forth. Um, and, and there's also some, <laughs> you know, some, some squirreliness because basically, China now controls about 49% of all the compute resource that's going into mining blocks, and they're this close to sort of taking over. And they could rewrite history if they have more than 51% of the network, which is a little bit frightening to a lot of people. Uh, this also leads to the whole poor governance aspect of things, because um, so, so Bitcoin, and this is from an open source perspective, I should say, um, Bitcoin is currently sort of hamstrung because the changes that they may or may not make to the technology actually have an impact on the value of Bitcoin, right? 
if they so the, so the current uh, uh, the, the the current controversy is over the the size of the block. So blocks today are I think are two megabytes and they hold some number of transactions, um, and it takes ten minutes to close. But as the puzzle gets harder and harder to solve, and they have to keep in, you know making it harder to solve because the network grows. As the network grows, you have to make the problem harder to solve. Um, uh, as you, as they do that, uh, basically. I was losing my, oh, so as you, as you do this, uh, basically it takes longer and longer. People complain more and complain more. They'd like to be able to increase the block size by basically doubling it because then they could sort of go back and, and make the puzzle a little bit simpler to solve um, by just making twice as many transactions to solve it for, right? Um, so, but they can't do that because everybody's afraid of making that change because they think that the Chinese will come after them because they've basically potentially affected the value of those Bitcoins that they own. Another problem is that Bitcoin and Ethereum are both public blockchains. And there's, there's I think, an important distinction to be made between public and private blockchains. Um, but because they're public blockchains, there's really no opportunity for privacy. There is anonymity, but there's no privacy. Everybody sees every transaction, and it's totally in the clear with Bitcoin and Ethereum, right? So people are looking for, how do we deal with privacy on the blockchain? Um, I talked about the anonymity, anonymity, I should say, of the processors that are there. So you, you know, in, in most public blockchains, you don't know who's there, right? And because you don't know who's there and who's who, um, there's absolutely no trust. And so that's why we need something like a proof of work uh, or proof of stake, which is another example of con uh, consensus I'll talk about in a moment, in order to uh, ensure that the people that are participating are there with a purpose and they have to sort of pay to get in. Is a, you know, the, the proof of work means that I'm basically doing some compute that's actually quite expensive, right, in terms of electricity, if nothing else. And I talked about finality. So the key concepts of a blockchain are basically, we have this notion, again, of a shared ledger, which is a blockchain that we distribute between the various participants in a business network of some sort. Um, now, permission is another aspect of the blockchain. Uh, so we have public blockchains, typically, but people are looking at, how do I solve the problems of, how do I get consensus more quickly, right? How, do, how can I achieve closure on transactions more quickly? If I have a certain degree of trust in the network, then I can actually use less expensive means of achieving consensus, less complex means of achieving consensus. Um, and I can just be solving for, well, what happens when nodes fall over and they don't get up kind of a thing, right? Uh, we can just deal with crash fault tolerant type systems. So permission is basically the notion of having a closed, a private network of blockchain nodes, if you will, distributed ledger nodes, that are all known to each other, right? Um, and it's basically invite only, right? And I can put some form of legal agreement or legal framework over that network that basically will prevent Keith from doing bad things and trying to, you know, to, to take over the, 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 the blockchain network that we are involved with, um, because now we can all sue him, right? Um, so we have permissions, so that's an aspect. Consensus, as I talked about, and I'll talk a lot more uh, about consensus in a moment, but consensus is essentially the notion that we're all agreeing that we all have the same thing, right? And we do that in a way that you know, can either be, uh, we, we trust that we all have the same value, and we're just making sure that everybody is awake and listening and paying attention, uh, or we can do so in a way that essentially ensures that some subset of the total network agrees on a thing before everybody sort of commits it to their ledger. And then finally, we have this notion of a smart contract. And the smart contract essentially is sort of exactly what it sounds like. It's basically taking the terms of a contract and encoding those in software, right, so that they execute on the blockchain. You can think about this sort of as a stored procedure that executes in the distributed ledger, right? And it executes at each, at each node. Um, <clears throat> and I'll talk a little bit about that 
And, and obviously, you know, as I mentioned, you know, so the benefits are that we can improve the efficiency of things, um, you know, so we, we, can, we can remove and make things tamper-proof and so forth to reduce risk in a business network. So the shared ledger. Again, we're recording transactions in a business network in the equivalent of, like I said, uh, equivalent of a database transaction log, but we're doing this in a secure manner that we ensure that uh, we can actually replay that transaction log and verify that the contents of the log have not been tampered with. So we can exchange it with each other, write it so that it populates our copy of the ledger, and we can verify that it hasn't been, hasn't been changed. Um, this becomes then the system of record. So we all know, I mean, so, so in, in, in IT today and in, in most enterprises, you're, you're maintaining a, a number of systems of record like your enterprise, your ERP system or your accounting system, what, what have, what, whatever it might be, and that's your version of truth. As I mentioned, when you're dealing in a business network with various transactions between business partners, suppliers, and consumers, and so forth, you're each maintaining your own copy of the source of truth um, but as a mirror image of one another. Um, when we think about using a shared ledger, though, we can actually have a single sort of centralized general ledger where when I put in a debit and a credit, we both see it, and we're just looking at it from, from different points of view. The smart contract, again, it's the set of rules that are encoded in some software, uh, in, in software that's executed on the blockchain, in the distributed ledger. Again, think of it as a stored procedure. Right, um, and and so the contracts, you know, they can be as simple as, uh, you know, they they can be as simple as I am going to exchange my Bitcoin with, yeah, you, know, you know, with somebody else, and it has the information about the two accounts, and it says that the Bitcoin is going from account A to account B. So it can be that simple, or it can be, you know, so another example would be in an insurance industry, they have. For instance, they have something called disaster insurance, which is basically you're going to take a bet. I live in Florida, a lot of hurricanes in Florida occasionally, and uh, so you can take a bet. I'm going to bet that there's no hurricane in 2016 in Florida, right? And you know, when, when that event occurs or doesn't occur, it can then trigger that contract to be executed, and the payout can happen automatically. So there's no need to do a claims process, right? because we can just record something from a trusted source that says, yes, indeed, this event has occurred, make the payout. Um, and so we can think about different approaches for how you might use this notion of a smart contract to essentially encode whatever, whatever that contract, the terms of that contract might have been. Um, people are looking at, for instance, taking actual legal contracts, the boilerplate, you know, with the fill in the blanks, and then uh, you know, writing, encoding that, writing that in software, and then the blanks that get filled in are the identities of the participants and so forth and the, and the monetary values. So I think it's important though to sort of think about this notion of a smart contract and the notion of a business network. So Ethereum, I mentioned Ethereum a little bit earlier. Ethereum is one of the early sort of um, blockchain technologies that, that followed, followed the Bitcoin. Um, and they have, again, it's a bunch of anarchists, basically. But basically, they've come up with this notion of the distributed autonomous organization. And what this is, is it's an organization that doesn't have people making decisions. It's software making decisions. And people just vote on whether or not they're going to add a contract and so forth. And so they defined this organization by the terms of what's in the, the smart contracts themselves. And they actually said that legally that the organization is defined by that software. Well, the problem is that all software has bugs, <laughs> including the, the smart contracts that comprise the, the DAO, um, the Ethereum DAO. Uh, and in fact, people were sort of highlighting and pointing out, you know, there's this recursion bug here which means that somebody could just recursively execute this particular transaction and in doing so drain the ether, the ether is the equivalent of the Bitcoin in the Ethereum community, um, out of an account in doing so without having to actually pay 
for the process of doing this. And uh, they were like, oh, well, nobody would ever do that. And somebody did. <laughs> somebody, again, nobody knows who this person was because on the internet you could be a refrigerator, right? You know, so, um, uh, so, so all of a sudden money starts draining out of the main uh, account for the DAO. It's got millions of dollars in it. Um, I think it was $150 million. And this guy started, or gal, I don't know if it was a guy, could be a refrigerator. Um, was draining, he, he had drained at one point about $50 million worth of value out of the main account for the DAO. Well, they put a stop to that, so they sort of turned the system, put it on pause, hold on, <laughs> stop the world, I want to get off, I want to figure out what we're going to do about this, and uh, Vitalik Buterin, who is the sort of the, the mind behind Ethereum, 22-year-old kid, he's an amazing, amazingly brilliant kid, but he was very naive, um, said, oh, I have an idea about how we can deal with this. We can do a soft fork and we can basically essentially write this guy out of the network. And we'll, we'll sort of rewrite history and say that um, uh, that never happened. Um, and uh, <laughs> so I, I put a link here and I'll, I'll share the slides obviously, but I put a link in here. It was a nice write up of exactly sort of what happened. But, um, uh, basically, so, they, they, so again, the terms of the contract were whatever the software says goes. That defines the nature of this organization and how it operates. So the question, and this I think is appropriate for this audience, is did he do anything illegal? Well, no, because it says he could do it because the code said, yeah, you can do that, right? So now, was it ethical? No, right? But the question is, is it legal? now? turn that on, on its head, so now the community has basically said, well, we didn't like what you just did, but you, what you did was essentially exploit a loophole in our governance, and so we're going to write you out, you know, sort of the tyranny of the masses, right? You know, so, um, so then the question becomes, well, how do you deal with that going forward if we create more of these things? Or if I create a business network and say that it's defined by the smart contracts in there, and something goes wrong, whatever it might be, whether it was intentional or unintentional, how do we deal with dispute resolution in that kind of a context, right? I think that's something that we have to think through very carefully uh, as we start rolling these things out. So privacy, confidentiality, and security are actually key aspects of this technology. So the ledger is shared. We're going to share this information. I was having a conversation earlier with Jeff Thompson, who I've known for like 14, 16 years, and we only just met today. <laughs> um, and uh, and he, he, was at, he, he asked, you know, I think a very legitimate question, and that is, so if I'm just going to sort of share all this information, I'm going to encrypt it, right? Well, we all know that that's, you know, nobody's ever decrypted uh, any, any encryption. So well, of course, that's not true. So, so I think a lot, of, a lot of people who are thinking about using the technology, when we say, well, we're just going to encrypt it and we're going to share it everybody, they're like, no, 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 you're not. <laughs> that's not, that's not going to be giving me the privacy and the confidentiality that I'm looking for. I actually only want the data shared with those who have a stake, who have a need to know that information. But I still want to do this blockchain thing, right? So we have to solve some of those problems. Um, so we need transactions to be private, so the contents of a transaction. So if I'm doing securities trading, for instance, I don't want my fellow brokers to see that I'm executing a particular trade so that they don't get in and arbitrage that trade and try and sort of make money on the fact that I'm going to do that trade, right? Um, and so that's, that's one use case. And we also don't want people to see which, which, which securities I'm amassing. Um, we need to be able to authenticate who's doing what to whom, uh, who has access to a particular smart contract, and so forth. Um, and so we need to be, and, and then finally, we also need to be able to authenticate all the different nodes in the network to each other so that as we're doing all this message passing, we know we're getting the message from somebody that we trust. And that requires an awful lot of advanced crypt cryptography, and, and frankly, uh, in some cases, we're actually looking at solving computer science problems that haven't been solved yet. Um, uh, things like homomorphic encryption to be able to do pr transactions on data that is encrypted. 
right? That's, that's something that, you know, we can do maybe one plus one equals two, but we're trying to figure out how do we do this for more advanced type use cases. Um, and then I talked about permission. And so permission is this notion of a private blockchain network, right, where all of the participants are known to one another. Um, and operating, I think, under some form of governance, some legal framework, whatever it might be. Um, this enables a certain degree of trust. And with that, we can sort of relax some of the uh, aspects of how we do consensus um, that enables us to do things bigger, better, faster. Um, so again, consensus is this notion of agreeing that a thing happened and that everybody agrees that that thing happened and we can now all record that safely in our ledger so that we all know that we have the same copy of the source of truth. So in an anonymous, in a public network, consensus is expensive. It has to be, right? Because you don't know who you're dealing with, right? Um, you know, Jeff could be trying to rewrite history and sort of undo my transactions so that all the money that I put in my bank account goes into his, right? We don't want that. Jeff does. <laughs> However, if the participants are known and, tr and to a certain degree trust one another, now again, uh, you know, you, you have, you know, J.P. Morgan and Citi, you know, probably, you know, fiercely battling each other, but I think if they enter into some sort of a business agreement under some sort of a contract, they'll at least know who, who they are and know that they have, there's a safety net, right, for that inter interaction. Um, and so as a result of that, we can actually achieve consensus at a much lower cost because it's going to be less complicated. So there's, again, there's multiple approaches to how we can build consensus in a blockchain or a distributed ledger network. I talked about proof of work, and again, that's this, this concept of solving a complex problem so it, it takes a lot of energy, if you will, a lot of computational resource to calculate a hash, uh, but that validating that that thing is correct can be very simple. Five minutes, wow, okay. Um, Intel, interestingly enough, came up with something called proof of elapsed time. And they said, well, if we put the software in a secure enclave and we can trust that software has not been tampered, then rather than forcing people to do an expensive calculation, we can just say, wait a random period of time and put a random time generator in there and every node waits and you know, you'll hit the lottery every once in a while, right? And so they have a, a, a way of doing this that's much more efficient. Uh, at least from an energy perspective. Proof of stake, this means that I'm gonna have some percentage of the network, some value in my account, and if it's found to be the case that I'm the one that's trying to exploit the system and send bad, me I'm the, the Byzantine general, uh, it's gonna cost you that stake, right? So there's a cost associated with doing bad things on that network. Multi-signature, so we do something and then we have a number of people that essentially endorse the transaction and say, yay, verily, we're gonna put our, our signature on this. Um, uh, but from our perspective, we feel that, IBM's perspective, we feel that an enterprise blockchain needs to have pluggable consensus because, again, it's gonna, depending on the use case that you use the technology, you may wanna apply different forms of consensus. So Byzantine fault tolerance, we have something called practical business, and again, that's sort of 50, 51%. Practical Byzantine fault tolerance allows us to have essentially up to a third of the network can be compromised and we can still continue to process. Um, and there's a number of different derivatives that people are looking at. So JP Morgan had uh, developed something they call Quorum that is trying to solve the problem in sort of more of a bilateral way. Corda from R3 is also looking at solving this problem a little bit more efficiently by dealing just sort of with bilateral consensus. Uh, and the Fabric, the Hyperledger Fabric project, this is the sort of derivative of what IBM has contributed to Hyperledger, is also looking at doing uh, essentially the same thing. Uh, you can also have just crash fault tolerance, and this is what typically we use in most distributed database systems today, is some form of Paxos-based or Paxos-derivative um, consensus, which is really just electing a leader, having that leader be the one that's telling everybody what's going on, and if they stop hearing from him, then they'll elect a new leader and continue lather, rinse, and repeat. 
Um, so here's a list of a number of notable blockchain implementations. Obviously, Bitcoin, Blockstream, Block Apps is another. All of these are, are, are uh, I'm sorry, Bitcoin and Blockstream are all based on Bitcoin. Block Apps is an Ethereum uh, implementation. Uh, Chain OS is a proprietary blockchain solution that's uh, got a, a sort of a consortium of banks working with them. I talked about Ethereum. Everledger is using blockchain to track the provenance of diamonds so that we can eliminate blood diamonds from the market um, so we, we know exactly where something came from. Guard Time is doing some interesting things in Estonia with identity. Um, and uh, actually, Estonia has got a very interesting uh, approach to dealing with identity. Uh, Hyperledger, Fabric. Hyperledger actually has uh, five top-level projects, but Fabric and Sawtooth are the two, uh, I think, uh, important ones currently. Um, Fabric was uh, originally from IBM, and Sawtooth is Intel's. This is the experimental blockchain platform that they use to create the proof of elapsed time. Uh, JPMC has done a couple of interesting experiments. They wrote their own called Juno, and then they used uh, Ethereum to, to do this quorum implementation that does uh, a little bit more advanced consensus. Ripple is a payment system. R3 uh, is a, a, a banking consortium that's developed something called Corda. Uh, and, and there's, a, there's a, a lot more of them, but those are the, the notable ones. Um, so I, 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 I could basically stop here. I mean, the, you know, the, 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 the last part of the charts is really more about the internals of how the Hyperledger fabric works. But um, you know, suffice, I'll just sort of, sort of suffice to say that this technology is really, really, really important that it be open, all right? That's, that's IBM's vision. You know, we really want it to be that it's not controlled or monetized by any one particular player. It needs to be a shared asset that we can all use and leverage, and so that's why we've taken this to open source. But you can't so, stop here because we need to answer these people's questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Absolutely. they need to understand this stuff because then <clears> we're going to actually make it rock and roll. So there should be mics going to the aisles if anybody wants to ask a question or get something explained, um, and then we can go and take this all downtown. If uh, John, come down to the microphone. There we go. Thank you. Yep. Well, uh, you conclude with a point, essentially saying we need to make this free, open source, spread it around, yeah. and yet you come from you know, the IBM world, which of course is a business. I'm, I'm curious to know. Oh, I, I didn't include that chart. Oh. <laughs> We've been doing open source since, I don't know, God was a corporal or something. Uh, there you <laughs> go. Uh, but I'm curious to know how companies that are involved and are in, investing in some ways, whether with hours or thought or even yeah. you know, business acumen, how they might be able to supercharge these efforts to make them more spread while still essentially keeping uh, so actually, a that viable was business. Sort of my next point here. Um, so there's open source and there's open source, right? Um, uh, so you know, there's an awful lot of open source that I would consider to be sort of the moral equivalent of furniture left by the side of the road, where somebody puts out a piece of software, publishes it on GitHub, and slaps an MIT license on it and says, here you go, knock yourself out. Um, and you know, nobody's going to be around to maintain it. And if you send in a pull request, nobody's going to bother with it, because here it is. And there's an awful lot of that out there, frankly. Um, and then there's sort of corporate open source, which you know one vendor or one individual or set of or, you know one group basically says we're going to open source this thing, and they retain exclusive control, and they basically it's a closed party. But you can send in pull requests and fix bugs. We'd be happy to hear from you. But you know basically we're going to say where it's going to go. Um, and the problem with sort of vendor-based open source, I think, is that, well, then there's still a vendor in control. It's really no different than proprietary software. It just happens to have a, a friendlier license on it. Um, from our perspective, the most successful open source initiatives have been those that are run under an open form of governance, whether it's an Apache, Eclipse, Linux Foundation, or in independent organizations like OpenStack. Mozilla and so forth, those are the ones that have really sort of transcended success, right? I mean, Apache started with one project. It's got over 400 now, right? How, why is that? You know, It's because we created a safe place to collaborate and innovate amongst even the fiercest competitors, right? We did an awful lot of web services work in Apache with Microsoft and Sun, right? I mean, fierce enemies, 
from a market perspective, but recognizing the value of collaborating and building something together, having a shared asset. Um, and so our perspective is that to do this right, it needs to be free and open, unfettered, and we need to have an open governance model. Mike, Mike and I helped to sort of pull together from you know, learning and, and, and sort of having the history of all the open source projects that went before it uh, to create something that we think enables people to come, get together, collaborate, innovate on really, really hard problems, but without worrying about whether or not you know, you're, the, the guy that you're collaborating with is gonna try and beat you in the market, right? Because we can all use this technology. Other questions? Come on down. <laughs> I, 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 if we had a classroom with mics at the seats, but I like this better anyway. Um, I had a question about how regulation fits into this environment yeah. of um, particularly given the sort of financial nature of Bitcoin and Ethereum right now, um, you may be aware of like New York City regulation, New York State regulation, um, some innovation might be quashed by regulation at the same time, regulation yes. might be able to keep up. Can you a little bit speak to that? I know some startups have actually left the New York area. So I'm gonna do the one true law professor thing and say hold that thought because I actually have exactly the person you wanna to talk to who happens to be Keith Agassim instead of happening to be Chris Farrell, but, but that's where we're going next, okay? For, for lawyers, this could get to be a little bit of a headache, all that smart yeah. contract stuff. Uh, that's, <clears throat> that sounds even worse than smart clients, right? Which is, of course, yeah. pretty bad in itself. I, I, uh, I, I will say this, though. Regulators like this idea of having visibility directly into the network. Um, the challenge, I think, is going to be actually yeah. evolving the regulation. No, that, that's right. I mean, regulators love enforcing. it because it's more material for right. regulators, but they don't like it if it's, A, more complicated than they can understand, or B, puts regulators out of work, yeah. um, which are two <laughs> possible <laughs> outcomes. Um, uh, so I think what we ought to do is take a break so people can serve biological needs for coffee and otherwise, and we'll resume to answer your question and many others in a couple of minutes. Thanks awesome. very much. Thanks, thanks everyone.